Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our series of devotions on Isaiah's servant song. And before we leave this first song, we're going to look in a little more detail at verse 4, which says, He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. Generally speaking, I really enjoyed my school days, but there was one event, an annual event, that I always dreaded, and that was the school cross-country. And everyone who was physically capable had to take part. You had to represent your house. And it was a, a gruelling circuit through mud and through the woods. And I was never very good at running. And I never did very well because I lacked the endurance, the persistence needed to be an effective cross-country runner. Well, one of the things that we see about the servant in terms of conducting his ministry is his perseverance. It's very interesting that when he says he won't falter or be discouraged, the words that are used are exactly the same words that had been used earlier to talk about the bruised reed that would not be broken or the wick that would not be extinguished. And the servant, though he'll be subject to all the same pressures as we are, he won't be broken by it. His wick won't be extinguished. He will continue to burn brightly. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. And in his great high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus gives thanks to the Father because he's been able to complete the work that the Father had given to him and to glorify his name. But there's still a task to be completed. And what evidence do we have that if we as the church are to complete that mission, then we are to be similarly servant-hearted? Well, there are lots of indications, I think, from Scripture. Here are four. First of all, the picture that Jesus himself uses of our discipleship is that of taking up the cross and following we are to walk the same path of servanthood that he has trodden before us. And then when Jesus washes the disciples' feet in the upper room, that great example of servanthood, he says to his disciples and to us, look, I've set you an example that you're to follow. And then outside of Jesus' own ministry, Paul, when he writes to the church at Philippi, in chapter 2 has that magnificent hymn about how Jesus took the form of a servant and became obedient even to death on a cross. But he begins that song by saying your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then finally Peter writing his first epistle actually quotes from one of the servant songs, the last of the songs, and then he says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So it seems very clear to me that we as a church are to continue to exercise that same ministry that the servant has been involved in. But I think there are some applications for us. The first is this, that the servant has been chosen by God. God delights in him, God sustains him and encourages him. If that was true for Jesus, then the same is true for us, that God delights in us and that God will sustain us and equip us. I think secondly, it means that we're to resist that kind of worldly temptation towards self-advertisement. We live in a celebrity culture and the church can easily become tainted by that. But we don't seek to be celebrities. We don't seek to draw attention to ourselves. Much of our work will be behind the scenes. It means that we'll have a concern for justice and for righteousness, because those things are the hallmarks of the servant's ministry. 
and finally i think that it means that much of our ministry will be conducted out of the public view with the crushed and with the broken if this if the suffering servant doesn't break the crushed reed doesn't extinguish the the fluttering wick then neither should we let me finish with a quote from philip yancey and one of his wonderful books which just reminds us of that servant ministry he says this i used to believe that christianity solved problems and made life easier increasingly i believe that my faith complicates life in ways it should be complicated as a christian i cannot not care about the environment about homelessness and poverty about racism and religious persecution about injustice and violence god does not give me that option well may god bless you today as you exercise that servant ministry